In Psalm 33, the psalmist writes, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully, and shout for joy. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Good morning and welcome to worship. We are glad that you are here. We've been praying that God will bless you, whether you're a first-time visitor, a long-time member, or you're watching online. Before we continue in worship, would you take a few moments to stand and greet those who are worshiping with you? to uh, highlight just a few of the announcements that are printed in your bulletin. Tonight at 6.30, there will be a special program um, of gospel music uh, as we celebrate the life and the witness and the music of John W. Peterson, uh, a man, a famous hymn writer who was born here in Lindsberg. Immediately afterwards, there will be a cookie reception in the multipurpose room. And uh, by way of preparing for that uh, event, we're going to have a little preview of that during our service, all of our hymns this morning are hymns that were written by John W. Peterson. The choir has come back just for today, and they're going to be singing a John W. Peterson song as well. Uh, ladies, there is a pool party scheduled for Thursday. Please take note of that at the Achenbach home, all the details listed there. Also, uh, ladies, there is a vision casting meeting Sunday, July 17th at 7 p.m. in the church library. And it's, it's uh, billed as a pivotal moment in the history of Covenant Women. So please, they want your input, so please plan on attending that meeting next Sunday at 7. And so the men don't feel left out. There's also a men's special meeting on July 24th during the Sunday school hour uh, from 9.30 to 10.30 in the North Kitchen, which is directly below us here. Uh, all men are invited. It's uh, about the men's encounter. It's a almost billed as a mini men's encounter. So please come get some information about the men's encounter. That's July 24th. VBS is at the end of the month, the last week in July. And it is for uh, ages uh, three year old through adults. Adults, I'm sorry if you are one or two years old, you're excluded. Everybody else is going to be a part of VBS. And uh, we encourage you to sign up for that at the, uh, in the Heritage Room. There's donations that are needed uh, for two-liter bottles, for cookies especially. They still need some volunteers, and they need help uh, with decorating and planning the decorations and creating some of the decorations, and they're going to have a meeting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. So if you'd be willing uh, to help with that, the decorating part, please come to the hospitality room here at the church at 7 p.m. this week. There is a um, trip scheduled to Branson, Missouri coming up later in the fall, and it's going to be to um, take in the play Moses, and we encourage you to sign up for that. The 55 plus group is sponsoring it, but you don't have to be 55 plus to uh, be a part of that. So please go down to the hospitality room or the uh, information table and see the details about that. With those events announced, I'm going to leave the rest of them for your perusal at home. Right now, we want to turn our attention to God as we focus on him. We are in the lectionary this year. We are going through the book of Luke, and uh, we are to the passage today on the Good Samaritan. And Pastor Jeremy will be uh, teaching about loving others. Please remain seated, but turn in your hymnals with me to number 12, and let us sing where two or three are gathered.
Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. If you now please stand as you are able, and turn in your hymnals to number 369, and sing with me, Surely, Goodness, and Mercy. sheep have gathered this morning uh, to worship you and to acknowledge you as our creator, our savior, and our sustainer. Be glorified in this hour of worship and in this whole week as we serve you, the good shepherd. And we pray this in the name of our savior, Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. This time I'd like to invite all the children to come right down here for the children's message. So children, you can come on down now. still have a few more coming, but we're going to go ahead and get started and let them join us. How are you guys doing? Good. Good. <clears throat> Somebody tell me what this is. Money. You recognized that right away, didn't you? Yes. You know, for all the month of July and all of our services throughout the rest of the month, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about money and about how God wants us to think about money and how he wants us to handle money. And uh, let me just say that the first rule of money, the most important thing by far and away that God wants us to understand 
about money in, that he tells us in his word is that it's not ours. Okay? So even though this money came out of my pocket, it's not my money. Does anybody know whose money it is? Very good. It's God's money, right? And so for none of us, we all have money, right? Everybody has some measure of money. You have money, your parents have money. Everybody has different amounts of money at different times, but it's not ours. It's not yours, it's not mine. It belongs to God. We are money managers. We are the ones who take care of it for God, and we help decide where it goes and what it gets spent on, but it's really God's. That's the most important thing we need to remember. Now, let me just make this as simple as I know how. There are really only three things you can do with money, okay? I can only think of three things that you can do with money. First thing you can do is spend it. That makes sense, right? That's easy and obvious. You could go to the store, you could use this dollar, you could buy something with it and spend it right now today. So you could spend it on something for yourself. The second thing you can do with money is to save it, which is essentially delayed spending. So you're going to spend it later, but you're going to hold on to it for now because you want to be sure you have enough for something later. So you can spend it, you can save it, or you can give it. You can give it away to someone else. Really, that's the only three things I can think of that you, everything else is a variation of those things. Now, here's how most people, at least in our country, handle money. First, they spend it. So when they get some money, they go and they pay their bills, they buy the things they want, they spend their money. That's the first thing that most people do. Then if they have any left over, they'll save a little bit, and usually there's none left over. So they, most Americans don't save anything. And if there's anything left over after that, then they'll give a little bit of money away to the tune of like 1% or 2% of our annual income statistically. And, and that's how most people handle money. But God doesn't want us to handle money that way. In God's word, fortunately for us, God gives us instructions about the order in which we are to handle money. And that order is exactly backwards. So in God's word, he tells us the very first thing that he wants us to do with the money is to give it away. So every time we receive any money, God wants us to take a portion of it, not all of it, but to take a, the first and the best of all the money that we have and to give it to God. And we do that by giving it to people, by blessing people. We love God by loving people. And so we're supposed to give it away. And so that's the first thing God wants us to do. That's a way for us to say that we love God first, because we give the first part to God. The second thing the scripture says to do is to save. Because if you spend first, you're not likely to have hardly any left over to save. So the wise person will take a portion of their money and save it first. So that they have something left over for later. Because they know that they're going to need it later for something else. And then the last thing we do with money is live on the rest. Whatever's left over after we give, after we save, then we live on what's left over. And so that's what I train my children to do. They've heard this a hundred times. Every time they receive money, we go over this. And I say, okay, what do we do with money? We give, save, and live on the rest. And here's how we do this. We have these three buildings. And each of these buildings represent one of those things. And this church building represents giving money to God. And so they'll take a portion of the money that they've received, and the very first per place they take it is they put it in the church building. And that's for giving money to God. And then when they go to Sunday school, or they go to his kids, they go to church or church camp, then they can come out and get money out of the church building, and they take it and they give it to God. That's the very first thing we do. And then this little house is a bank. And then they take the next part of their money and they put it in the little pretend bank and that's for their savings. That's for things like college and things like that much later down the road when they're going to need a lot of money all at the same time. And then every once in a while I'll take that money out of the pretend bank and I'll go put it in the real bank so they have money later on. And then the third thing, the third house, is a toy store. And so they can take their last bout of money and they put it in the toy store and it's all marked for them so when they want something, they can come and get into the toy store and take their money and go and buy it because that's living on the rest. And so that's the order in which God wants us to do this. 
And so let's review that very quickly. What's the first thing we do with money? Give. What's the second thing? Save. And then? Right. So say that with me. Give. Save. Live on the rest. One more time. Give. Save. Live on the rest. And uh, just for fun, let's have your parents do it too. Let's review this, shall we? Give, save, live on the rest. Okay. Now, children, let me tell you. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. If you will do this, I'm telling you, your life will be so much better than many, many people who do this exactly backwards. For one thing, if you do it in this order, you'll be honoring God. Because what you're saying is, God, I love you first. I love you most. I give you the first and best of what, we ha- what I have. It's an act of worship. It's an, act of ex- it's an expression of gratitude and love for God. You'll be honoring God if you give first. And then the second thing is when something comes up and you need a whole bunch of money all at once, all of a sudden, you'll have something set aside. It's, it's, an, it's a matter of wisdom to have something set aside so you don't spend it all. And then to live on the rest, not, not, to, not to spend more money than we have. If you can do it, and you can do it in this order, promise you that your life will be so much easier if we do it God's way. Okay? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's so hard for us because there's so many things we could spend our money on and uh, it's hard not to just spend it all on ourselves right now. Uh, And everything in our culture is encouraging us to do exactly that. But I ask God that you will help these children to walk a different path. That they will walk in a path of wisdom. That they will give first as an act of worship. And they will save second as an act of wisdom. And they will live on the rest as an act of discipline. And so I ask that as a blessing on them and even for generations to come, that generations will be blessed through the proper management of your money. And I ask this as a blessing on them now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. In Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, he wrote this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And so with that in mind, I want to ask the ushers to come forward this morning to receive our offering. And if you're a visitor with us, uh, we don't expect you to give in the offering. We just want you to be our guest, if you would. Uh, But we would ask if everyone would please sign the registration folder as it's about to come by. If everyone would sign that, that would be great. And uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to be praying over our family prayer list. And it's printed inside the bulletin. Uh, I'll give you a chance to add to that list in a moment. Let me be the first to do so. Uh, There's been a couple of camps this last week. There's another one this week. But um, uh, two camps, one up in Nebraska and then one at Rock Springs. And I can't really speak to the one in Nebraska, but I can give a brief report on what happened at Rock Springs. Our church was well represented there, both with campers and with leaders. Uh, Of of all the staff that were at camp, 17 of them were from Linthrop. So we sent 17 leaders. uh, And uh, then of the campers to speak of the spiritual fruit of this week, seven campers total expressed a desire uh, to follow Jesus for the very first time. First time commitments, there were seven. And then rededications, there were 23. Yeah, and uh, I know. Yeah, and thank you. I know many of you gave money and many of you prayed. And so that is the fruit of your investment in the kingdom. Camp's a powerful ministry, so thank you for uh, investing in the next generation, uh, all those lives uh, marked for eternity. So thank you for that. Uh, 
want to be in prayer, the, the one prayer request I'll bring up uh, is nationwide, uh, perhaps beyond that, and that's, of course, all, all the violence and the shootings, the murders that have happened this last week, uh, many of it uh, tinged with uh, racial overtones. And uh, we just want to pray for racial reconciliation to take place. Uh, one of our ministries as Christians is a ministry of reconciliation, of bringing estranged groups back together again to tear down dividing walls of hostility. And I think you'd agree that we have a problem in our culture. And it goes beyond guns. It's far deeper than a gun problem. It's a theological problem. At its root, we have a theological problem. And that is that we fail to recognize the hand of God, the fingerprint of God on humanity, that people, every people, every person is created in God's image. And so every person is inherently sacred and set apart for God's purposes, bearing his image. And when we forget that, then we can treat other people lightly and treat their lives with indifference. And so please pray with us that, that there will be good theology that would come about and great uh, repentance and a reconciliation between estranged groups. Uh, we need God's help with that. So. Are there others that we can pray for? Prayer requests or praises? Okay. I want to pray for Kara. Kara Peterson as she's uh, as leaving soon uh, and, and she's getting ready to go out on a mission field. So I want to pray for Kara. Uh, we're reminded to pray for the Heimer family uh, as the, the mother and the fam mother and wife of the family was murdered recently. Uh, and so I want to pray for the family, also for law enforcement, that they will have the insight they need to uh, find, find the perpetrator and bring uh, them to justice. So please pray for them in that situation. John. Yes, congratulations to both of you. <clears throat> John just shared uh, that uh, he proposed, and Deb said yes. And apparently he's sad about this. Uh, but uh, no, we're, gra we're grateful for the good news, and congratulations, guys. Blessings on you. Are there any others? Linda May? Thank you. It's an, an update on Brandon Rogers, who uh, has a brain tumor and uh, continues to seek treatment for that. Is going back down to MD Anderson. The tumor's back, and uh, now they need to decide on a, a course of treatment, what kind of surgery they might do. Uh, and so please be in prayer. Continue to pray for Brandon and his family as they battle this. Thanks, Linda. Is that Coulter I see back there? 
Do you have a prayer request or a praise? Oh, yes. A praise report for his grandfather doing better and better able to walk now. And we are grateful for that. Thanks for sharing, Cole. From Mike. I want to encourage you to... Oh, D. Okay. I want to pray for another Brandon, a uh, nephew of Dee's who is struggling with uh, multiple addictions. And uh, I want to pray for freedom and deliverance from those uh, bondages, but also pray for uh, wisdom and insight into good choices, to make good choices. So pray, please pray for Brandon's deliverance. Yeah. Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Now, Kendall shares a, a bit of a report from Covenant Cedars, the other camp that happened this week. Thank you for going and serving. Uh, and he just reports that really good fruit came from that as well. And so please continue to pray for the camp ministry. And I believe the senior hires that are there this week, is that, is that right? Yeah, so be in prayer for the, the senior high as well as uh, God works in their lives this week. Okay, okay I want to encourage you to be in prayer for these things. Uh, during the week, and in just a few minutes, we'll have Pastor Jeff pray for them. As we prepare for prayer, if you wouldn't mind, turning to hymn number 448 and singing with me, Shepherd of Love. You have demonstrated over and over how important relationships are to you, 
how you you designed this for relationships, relationships with each other, and a relationship with you. And as the text that we're going to hear later this morning, the Good Samaritan teaches us, that we are to cross the, the things that divide us, the ethnic and the religious and any divide, and you teach us to reach out and to love others. And so, Lord, with our, with our world the way it is and our, our country the way it is, we ask that you would destroy the enemy's attempts to destroy relationships. Lord, that you would give us the grace to forgive each other and our sins and mistakes. And that you'd give us the grace to repent of the things we need to repent of even if it's just indifference. Lord, we ask that we, as your church, would lead the way in reconciliation and in healing of broken relationships, that we would be truly your ambassadors in, in the kingdom of reconciliation, and that we would be salt and light. We pray, Lord, for families who are grieving losses in this past week, these public losses. We pray for officers and, and we pray that you would protect them and give them wisdom and when they interact with, with the citizens. We pray, Lord, for others who are grieving, for Mike Doherty's family and for the Heimer family. And we pray your mercy and comfort on all as they turn to you, Lord, may they find help and healing. For those who need physical healing, we ask that you would take care of those that we love, that we've committed to you, everybody's name that is on the list. Lord, for, for the school board as it meets tomorrow, for the covenant board as it meets tomorrow, for the Broadway RFD cast and crew for these next two weeks, Lord, we pray that you would uh, give protection, that you would guide us, that you would give us wisdom as these groups meet. Father, Lord, we thank you for the ministries of camp and VBS and the impact that they have in hearts and minds and, and lives. And we pray that the decisions that have been made, the recommitments that were done, Lord, that they would bear fruit, fruit that would last not only years and decades, but for generations. We thank you, Lord, for hearing these prayers, for how you're going to answer these prayers, for your care for Christian, for um, the work that you are doing in our community, Lord, to exalt your name and draw people to you. We pray that you would be glorified in all of these things, and we pray your special grace this morning on Pastor Jeremy as he delivers a word from you to us. Give us ears to hear. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. If you would please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, um, chapter 10, and the passage is found on page 1,615 of your pew Bibles, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And this is the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. 
They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. day in this neighborhood, it's a beautiful day for a neighbor, would you be mine, could you be mine, it's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for beauty, would you be mine, could you be mine, I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you, I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you, so Let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, Would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? My neighbor? I'm glad we're together again. Mr. Rogers might be one of the more popular people to talk about being a neighbor. I think he would have made a great neighbor, obviously. I mean, who wouldn't want to be Mr. Rogers' neighbor? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. A beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you please? Won't you please be my neighbor? I'm sure your neighbors sing that to you all the time, right? How many of you have at least one neighbor who is like the complete opposite of Mr. Rogers? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand right now. Their song would go something like this. It's an awful day in the neighborhood. Please go away. Please go away. I don't mind if you move. Please don't be my neighbor. Okay, I want you to pray for that neighbor right now. Maybe you've heard the phrase, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. So what does it mean to be there? Do I really always want State Farm there? Always there sounds straight up creepy. The only thing I want always there is the Holy Spirit. I appreciate my insurance agent, but I don't want him to always be there. Always There kind of sounds like a striper song from the 90s. I am always there for you. Cue the bumblebee outfits and bad hair. If I had an insurance company, our phrase would be, like the best neighbors, we are there when you need us. Jesus said some incredible challenges to us about neighbors. Jesus said to love your neighbors as yourself. That sounds simple if your neighbor is Mr. Rogers. Most likely, your neighbor is not Mr. Rogers. As we read earlier in Luke 10, 25 through 37, Jesus, asked, Jesus was asked by an expert in the law, 
he asked, he was asked an expert in the law, how do I, in, in, how do I inherit eternal life? Was this expert in the law asking the question so he could do the least and still make it to heaven? Was he looking for a formula to get into heaven? Jesus responds to the expert in a way that pointed him in a new direction. A way that says there is no magic formula for following Jesus. And it's not about doing the least to get into heaven. If you're asking that question, you're missing the point. Living your life for Christ is not about how close to sin we can get. It's about how far from sin we can, how far from, we can stay away from sin. It's, not, it's about how much glory we can bring to God. At first, the young expert of the law replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, and with all your mind. This was exactly what everyone was expecting. This was commonly referred to as the Shema. This comes from Deuteronomy 6.4. After the young expert recited this, he felt pretty good about himself. So, he went a step further and asked Jesus another question, which can be dangerous sometimes. He wanted to justify himself, so he asked, Who is my neighbor? The young expert was probably looking for an easy answer, one that would just he could put into a formula and follow. What Jesus said next put him in his place. The young expert wanted to be able to choose his neighbors and to want to have a select few that he could love. But Jesus lets him know we don't get to choose our neighbors. You might choose your house, you might choose your neighborhood, but you don't choose your neighbors. What the young expert should have said was, Jesus, is there anyone who is not my neighbor? To me, that question would have been more impressive. The young expert was trying to dictate who he had to care about, but Jesus was not going to let that go. I love the challenging response that Jesus gave. In verse 30, he said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him and passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when we saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on him and wine. Then he took, him, then he took the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Then the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after them, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for, for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Jesus flips the question around and asks the young expert, who just became the first-year intern and serves him a piece of humble pie? Jesus asks him, which of these three do you think was a neighbor? Which makes the word neighbor something that we are as God's people rather than defining a group of people called neighbors. What's fascinating about the story is who didn't stop and, and who did stop and help. First of all, here's some background on this trip. The trip advisor would say, don't travel between Jerusalem and Jericho. Don't travel at night. Don't travel with valuables. The Yelp reviews on this trip would be a negative five stars. This road was notoriously dangerous. Jerusalem is 2,300 feet above sea level. The Dead Sea where Jericho stood is 1,300 feet below sea level. For those of you that are good at math, you've figured out that the road drops 3,600 feet in about 20 miles. The sudden turns made it a great place for robbers to come and steal whatever you had. What makes this story fascinating to me is who stops. First, we have the traveler. He was traveling alone, which was, which was not considered wise, so maybe he deserved to get beat up. No, he, he didn't deserve to get beat up. The man obviously was not an Eagle Scout prepared for the worst. Second, we have the priest. This really stings because Jesus drives home a point with this one. The priest represented something about religious service that is not good. 
The priest wanted to serve God from a religious point of view. The priest was busy with his religious service, maybe going to or coming from church. But there's a difference between religious service and Christianity. Christianity looks to serve, love, and forgive. But religious service looks to make, looks to, looks, looks to make this into a formula and do what you have to do. The goal is not spiritual recognition or stars for your attendance, but to be like Christ. Being like Christ is harder, and there is sacrifice. So the priest didn't just ignore the traveler. He, tra- he walked on the other side of the road like he would a car that was pulled over. He didn't do that for safety. He did it because he didn't want to get too close to the body. Being a good neighbor is messy sometimes. Third of all, we have the Levite. At least the Levite walked a little bit closer to the traveler on, on the other side. But does this deserve a participation award? No. Did he have compassion? No. Maybe he had good reasons to stop. Maybe he th- not to stop. Maybe he thought the traveler was already dead, but he didn't bother to chide. Maybe he was afraid of the body being a decoy. When you stopped, the bandits would come out and then beat you up. The Levite's motto was safety first. Being a good neighbor is not always safe. Fourth and finally, there was the Samaritan. A Samaritan. This was the least likely so far to stop and help. In fact, he had good reason to keep walking and walking fast. The Jews wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans, but yet this man stopped, had compassion on the man. He stopped, he bandaged his wounds, put him on his donkey, and took him to the inn. Then he paid for the inn. Then the Samaritan told the innkeeper he would he would pay for anything he needs. He didn't stop at the bakery and buy day old bread. The Samaritan but gave him his best. He didn't check to see if he deserved help. He just helped. The Samaritan didn't think, Will this guy pay me back? The Samaritan man had compassion. For which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Jesus told the young expert in the law that following Jesus is not about a list that we get to make. It's about a lifestyle of service that God calls us to. A lifestyle of service that is harder than a list. Loving your neighbor is a lifestyle of service. When Jesus makes the Samaritan the example, Jesus points out that neighbors can come in surprising places, not people that are just like you. The lawyer's attempt to limit his neighbors only goes to limit his friendship and his fellowship. What is the story telling us about loving Jesus and our neighbors? First of all, you can't love God without loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor is hard, messy, and emotionally draining. It's not easy especially those neighbors that don't want to be loved. You know that some of the primary challenges to loving your neighbors are? First of all, this might be surprising to you, electric garage doors. You drive in, you drive out, you don't have to talk to anybody. Mine recently does not work right, so maybe God is trying to tell me something through that. Technology. We stand in line, we don't talk to people, we look at our phones. At Starbucks, I can order my drink ahead of time and avoid The line, convenient, but all these advances are taking the conversations away. Your fridge is another challenge. In third world countries, someone has a lot of meat. They don't have a freezer, so they invite everybody that they know. These technologies are great, but they isolate us at times, too. We can too easily ignore people and and converse with just the people that we want to. So what's the answer? Sell your fridge on buy, sell, trade? Probably not. But look for ways to engage with your neighbors. Look for ways to love them. Look for ways to serve them, to honor them. Look for ways to build bridges instead of walls. Look for ways to be at the table together instead of making distance. You don't get to pick and choose who your neighbor is. You can pick your house, the color of your house, the layout of your house, but you don't pick your neighbors. There was a gentleman who did not get along with his neighbor very well. And he noticed that his neighbor had an unsecured Bluetooth speakers. He set the speakers to play at approximately 2 a.m. every night, some really loud and scary music. He wanted his neighbors to move. His his neighbor eventually left. I'm not giving you ideas here, all right? If this happens to me or someone that I know, I'll know where you got that idea. 
If you're thinking of doing that, I want you to just pray for that neighbor right now and pray for yourself. <clears throat> Find ways to appreciate and love your neighbors, not drive them away. It's clear that the young expert wanted to define and determine who his neighbors are. If I get to choose who I love and who I care for, that is not the full gospel. James 2, 8 and 9 says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. 1 John 4, 19, 20 says, If we love, he, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love one another. Third, and finally, have compassion. Go and do like the Samaritan. Who's your neighbor? People who have different beliefs than you. This younger generation, some of them, some of them just want to ask the right questions. You, you don't have to agree on everything. You probably won't agree on everything. Go and love them. Show them and live the truth. Who's your neighbor? People whose appearance might make you a little bit uncomfortable. If we can't accept people on how they look, they will never feel a part of us, and they won't want to. Go and love them. Who's your neighbor? People who are depressed. Depression is more widespread than you would care to imagine. Go and love them. Who's your neighbor? The alcoholic next door, the one who drinks alone during the day. Go and love them. Who's your neighbor? The couple next door whose marriage is falling apart. Marriages are being attacked. Humbly walk with them and love them. Go and love them. Who's your neighbor? The widow next door. This can be a difficult time of life, but yet they have so much to say and to offer. Go and love her. Who's your neighbor? The, da the police station in Dallas. My heart breaks for what took place. Pray for the policemen you know everywhere. Love and pray for Dallas and policemen. Who's your neighbor? Those who are marginalized and in pain by all the chaos and loss. This is a difficult time as we mourn, pray, and listen. Go and love them. Who's your neighbor? The person who talks behind your back. If your neighbor talks behind your back, the best thing to do is pray behind their back and let God deal with it. Go and love them and pray for them. Who's your neighbor? The person who drives too fast in your street. People will always disappoint you, but love them anyways. Go and love them. Who's your neighbor? The neighbor with the loud dog. People will disappoint you again. Go and love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? I am. We are all neighbors. God calls us to love each other and to serve each other. Luke 14, 12 through 14 tells us how to throw a party. Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is challenging. It's hard, but it's so good. Look to, those, to, look to love those that can't pay you back. Look to serve those that won't pay you back. Love your neighbor, even the ones who are not as polite as Mr. Rogers. A few years ago, we were living in Minnesota, and I was driving to church for Christian education meeting. I left right on time, about a 15-minute drive to get to church. As I was cruising on the freeway at about 64 miles per hour, I noticed to myself a car on the right-hand side that was switching, changing a flat tire. And I thought to myself, hmm, safety first. I better get to church. It wouldn't be a good idea to stop. I mean, they were probably practicing changing a tire because people do that in the dark next to the freeway, right? And maybe they neglected to check their tires. And maybe they just deserved a flat tire. Maybe. Probably not. So I got to the meeting on time. But a few minutes after the meeting started, in walks one of the members of the Christian Education Board. It was a senior pastor. He said, sorry, I'm late. I had a flat tire on the way to church. In my head, I instantly thought of Luke 10, 37. I am the guy who passed him by. That was me. Then I quickly told Norm that I didn't take the freeway that day. No, I'm just kidding. I felt horrible. I could have at least given a hand. But I was busy on the way to church. Look for ways to make this practical. I know you can't stop for every car on the freeway. 
So let's start with your neighbors. Practical, here's a practical challenge for you. First of all, name all your neighbors that live next to your house on a first name. Everyone who lives in the house next to you on, a, on approximately the, the eight houses if you live in a block. If the neighbors live miles away from you, um, then it might be a little more challenging. Can you list at least one thing about your neighbors beyond their names that's beyond a first conversation piece? Some of you, this might be easy. You've lived there for a long time. Some of you, this is harder. But it gives you something practically to do to be able to pray for your neighbors, to think about your neighbors, to know, do you really know your neighbors? Some of your neighbors might live miles away, and, and hopefully you get along with those well, too. But all of us have somebody that lives next to us. As someone who has lived in over 20 totally different neighborhoods, I know that neighbors come in all kinds of different situations. I've been a minor minority. I've felt left out. I've had, I've had neighbors complain about my lawn. I've had a neighbor that liked to mow my lawn. I had very wealthy people as physical neighbors. Bill Gates lived within 30 miles of me. I had homeless friends that were as physical neighbors. But, God calls, but God's call to us is simple, yet so challenging. Love your neighbor as yourself. The question is not, will you have an opportunity to serve? But the question will be, what will you do when your opportunity comes? What will you do when your neighbor needs you? It will happen when you're busy, it'll happen when it's inconvenient. You won't have enough time to help your neighbor, possibly. But it will happen, possibly today or soon. The world is full of those in pain. Our community is full of people in pain. And how will you respond? The response of the thieves was, what's yours is mine, and I will take it. The response of the priest and the Levite was, what's mine is mine, and I will keep it. The response of the Samaritan was, what's mine is God's, and I will share it. Go and be like the Samaritan. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go and do likewise. If you would now please stand as you are able and turn in your hymnals to number 493 and sing with me Cups of Cold Water and we'll use the refrain for our closing refrain. Number 493.
Jesus was asked, which is the greatest commandment in all the law? He said this, I leave this with you as our charge. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Go in peace.